are in Mount Roscoe, part of Auckland's volcanic field and home to 54 different nationalities and 12 churches. Now, I'm a world citizen of African descent. My family can trace its lineage from both East and West Africa. We are wandering spirits, and I've called New Zealand now home for the last six years. And I've embarked on a successful acting career. This time on Neighbourhood, I'm going to show you some of what this large and dynamic suburb has got to offer. We find out how Mount Roscoe is at the centre of this innovative new programme designed to get migrant kids into sport. Without soccer, I actually am kind of worried about where I would be. Meet playwright, poet and pediatrician Renee Liang. Yesterday, a shop lady said, your English is very good. I wanted to say, of course it bloody is, I was born here. We also partake in an ancient Ethiopian ritual. Oh, this is this much, much nicer than cappuccino and flat white. <laughs> and uncover a hundred-year-old treasure from Sri Lanka. It takes about an hour or two to put the costume on. Also, there's a special person that knows how everything fits together. I'm Brian Mantenga, and this is my neighborhood. I grew up in Victoria Falls, which is a multi-cultural, multi-ethnic town in Zimbabwe. It was fantastic because I had one of the great natural wonders of the world in my backyard, and the whole world had come to visit it, and I had a chance to see the whole world. Uh, it was like traveling without moving. It was a fun, fun experience, and when I ended up traveling, it was great because I did get a chance to measure myself up against the whole world. And it ended up here in New Zealand, Mount Roscoe to be exact, and I love it here because I'm one short picturesque bus ride away from the city, and I've got a number of small, beautiful parks that I'm close to. It's a fantastic place to take my son. And I have a two-year-old son, and his mother's Canadian, and I'm African, and he's growing up in New Zealand. So my little African nook kiwi is, is the light of my life, and it's one of the most amazing and frustrating things I've ever done in my life. It's, uh, it's fantastic, and I think the problem that I find, what always plagued me was, um, you have all these different parts, I want them to be a whole, I want them to embrace every small part that is him. And when you're from a colonized country, there is the danger of not taking care and remembering what your culture is. Now, in Mount Roscoe, there's a unique project aimed at helping people from different communities to connect through sport. I'm from Pakistan. I came here when I was nine years old. And the reason we chose Mount Roscoe is because the mosque is right behind our house, and which makes it easier for us to, you know, just go because we pray five times a day. I've been involved in community sport a lot, mostly Afghan community and Somalian community. I've been with them for four years now. I coach the young ones and I play with the old ones. They go to mosque, of course, that's how they know each other. So we're like, okay, rather than you getting into trouble and stuff, why don't you come join a sport and play as a team, you know, so you can make friends over there rather than, you know, just doing stupid stuff all, all, all over. All right, guys, thank you very much for coming here. And on behalf of Connect Sport, I would like to welcome every team that is here today. My name is Omar Mohammed. I'm from Somalia. I've been in New Zealand now for almost 12 years. I'm involved in the project called Connect to Sport. And the aim of this project is to connect with diverse community who, who are living in Montrosco. Today we are actually at Metro Grand, where we've actually invited all communities just to kind of have a go at the club, at the club ground. Hey, dark blue on this field. Hey, yellow, over here. There was no relation between the communities and the club previously, so with this project we're actually trying to facilitate that relation between the club and the community so, there, so we could actually re reduce those barriers that the communities are facing. These guys play within their own community groups and occasionally amongst each other, and this is uh, Auckland football and the, and the clubs and the connector sports. 
attempt to actually get them all working together. One of the key questions I ask the clubs is about, you know, what is the ethnic mix of your club? You know, and generally it is, it is uh, white European, where if they have a look in the community around them, there's a, a big disparity about their membership and the community. Coming to New Zealand, everyone want to play sports, but the main challenge is where to go next within those African communities, football is their life. For me, football was my savior when I came to New Zealand. We all know sport is a very universal language. You don't speak any language. As long as you could kick a ball around, as long as you could enjoy yourself. So sports teaches a lot of things. It teaches you how to be disciplined. It teaches you how to really be a team player within, within your community and also outside your community as well. So a sport gives you the opportunity to really socialize with the wider New Zealand society. It, it opens doors for you to really have barbecue with, with Kiwis out there as well. Hey, boys. So all these people are like, um, they welcome you, it's pretty good to see your mates playing. Supporting them. It brings like communities and stuff together, so that's good as well. Connective sport is actually very helpful. I reckon they actually do need it in the community because it just gets every one of the kids together and it gives them a motive to actually do something good and you know, something which would actually help them in the future. Could maybe take out their hidden pot potentials maybe. <laughs> I'm from Afghanistan, so I just came here like around seven years ago. And I just came here first, I didn't know what soccer was, you know, I never played it over there in a the village. So I came here and then I meet these guys and then I got into soccer, so yeah. We have like different languages, we all like come from like different like cultures and we have different respects. So like we, we learn a lot and we are Kiwis. Jay, all blacks. <laughs> <laughs> My dad's from North Africa and Tunisia, and my mom's half Chinese, half New Zealand. Um, yeah, my sport's football, and most of these guys play football except for Abdul. He's a ballerina, but um, <laughs> but yeah, that's this is our sport, and that's how we come together. And now we're just looking for a club to join so we can all play as a team and show you know everyone that you know we can play as a team and we can play just like everyone else. Look at all these talented players. They just play socially in the park with their mates. Why not put a, a Metro shirt on and, and play for the club? You know, there's some definite inhibitors to why they don't play for the club, you know, which are basically uh, transportation, great goal. Transportation, cost, um, and the fact that maybe the clubs hasn't communicated to the committee as a whole as well as they could have. Personally, I could easily relate to this project. I, I remember first time coming to New Zealand. And, and, and I see the challenges that all these kids are actually going through right now. Without soccer and without working on cars and stuff like that, I actually am kind of worried about where I would be. Because soccer, it just releases stress as well, as well as, you know, for, it keeps you fit also. It actually calms me down and makes me think with a calm head. Or if I'm angry or something, I'll just, you know, play soccer and then next thing you know, I've got a massive smile on my face. What do you think? What do you think about joining club now, as like as a whole team? Yeah, yeah. I'm not keen from the start. From the start? Yeah. All right. Yeah. Personally, I'm really passionate about this project, and I really love seeing kids being and being in the club environment, joining clubs. And my dream is one day to see maybe one or two of these players representing the all white. My dad's a musician. He's a troubadour. He tells his stories through song. And believe me when I tell you, you never want to hear me tell any story through songs. It's quite painful. That's why I prefer the spoken word. And oral storytelling is, is a huge part of how stories are carried on in Africa. You have grandfathers telling stories to grandsons over fireplaces. Those are actually memories of mine, having my granddad tell me a story on his knee of um, how things came into being, great creation stories of the rabbits and, and how the baobab tree has planted upside down. It's a long story, I'll tell you one day. Now, when I had a chance to do a bit of acting when I was doing Shortland Street, the writers were very, very keen uh, for me to tell my culture and for me to have the positive aspects of that culture represented because we don't want caricatures, we want the reality. We want to know what it truly means to be something. Now, we have 
in my lovely suburb, someone uh, called Renee Liang, and she tells stories and she explores what it really means to be Kiwi. depending on what day it is. So sometimes I'm a paediatrician working around New Zealand and sometimes I'm a poet, a playwright and a blogger. Yesterday, a shop lady smiled at me and said, your English is very good. Her eyes crinkled in a let's be nice to aliens kind of way. I wanted to say, of course it bloody is I was born here. How about you? But of course, I said nothing. Hardly her fault. We Asians all look the same anyway. I'm quite interested in exploring family stories and also stories around culture and identity. Um, although I don't really want to be pigeonholed as somebody who only writes about culture and identity or only writes Chinese plays or Chinese poems. You know, I'd really like to be just known as a writer. The first Asian AB is a play that I wrote last year for the Rugby World Cup Arts Festival. At the time, I didn't really know anything about rugby, so it was a little bit ridiculous that somebody like me decided to write a rugby play. It meant I had to learn about the game, and I learned how to watch it, and I learned to appreciate it in time for the World Cup. <laughs> Okay, guys, I want you guys to totally stuff it up. Oh, yeah. 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 Okay. <laughs> yeah. It's about a, an immigrant, um, so a Malaysian immigrant who comes to New Zealand as a student, and um, he's only 13 at the time he arrives, and he meets a, a, a friend, a uh, Samoan New Zealander called Muk, and they hit it off and they become best friends and, and they learn to play rugby together. And they realise that this is their way to fit into New Zealand society. 15 metres to go, Kashmir on his left, but Lamu is shouldering through, they can't catch him! Five metres in, try New Zealand! There's uh, only two actors and they play everybody. So they play about 15 characters between them, including um, older women and girlfriends and uh, classmates oh, and rugby teams. My name is Margaret, or you can call me Margie or even Mum. Oh, where was I? Nay how? The core question in the play is what makes someone Kiwi? And I guess I ask that question because, you know, we're all obsessed with Kiwiana, um, you know, so rugby, racing, beer, pavlova and jandals, you know, if you, if you do all these things then you must be Kiwi. And I'd really like to uh, suggest that actually it's not that simple. I mean, I certainly don't fit that stereotype, but I consider myself fully Kiwi. I actually had a, a great childhood growing up in New Zealand. It was because I stood out and I liked uh, standing out. I had the usual uh, Chinese mushroom bowl haircut. Uh, I was one of the few Asians at my primary school and I was also usually the shortest, so that, that helped. As I've got older as well, I've started being more interested in my Chinese heritage, um, so I started exploring that in my plays. And I've also been aware that other people of Chinese or Asian heritage have had different experiences to me, you know, not necessarily so positive. And so I started exploring that by um, interviewing my friends and um, sometimes making plays out of their experiences. What we're trying to do in the scene is convey what it's like sometimes to be at school and um, feel discriminated against me. So we're going to show the ugly side. Mm -hmm. Because even though he's really angry for his friend, actually he's really angry for himself as well. You sticky, fat, fruit-faced balangi! Well, that's my friend you're talking about! It's not his fault. What? For being ugly? For being a balangi? I just think Auckland is a wonderful melting pot of all these ethnic communities. Mount Roskill is actually a really good microcosm of it. Why are they so angry all the time? There's all kinds of amazing works that have come out, particularly in the last five years, from uh, African, Japanese, Chinese, Indian, 
um, writers and actors. There's a lot of support for it from um, funding bodies and also from the community. I'm not actually very sure what's ahead of me in the future. For the past five or so years, I've really just followed my nose and just chosen to do things that delight me. I will continue to do things that delight me, that interest me, that I think pose really interesting questions that I want to answer for myself. Um, and hopefully I'll continue to share my work as well because I really get a buzz out of that. Stone sculpture is actually very big in Zimbabwe. The word Zimbabwe actually means houses of stone. And there's a great ancient city with, uh, carved out of stone and one of the national symbols is a great stone eagle. This reminded me of my grandfather, my, my mom's father, and he hunts back in Africa. And when I saw this, I thought this would be a good symbol for me to remember him by. When my son was born, we were trying to teach him lo local language words. Uh, this became known as Sekuru. Sekuru means grandfather in Shona. And whenever he sees this, it's a reminder of where his dad is from. It's also a good, uh, a good link to something that he isn't totally aware of, but it's a great cultural reminder for both of us. Hmm. And, uh, it's important to remember this stuff. And uh, quite close to here, we have a Sri Lankan family, and they have a different kind of cultural icon. There's a costume they have that's been in their family for over a century. My full name is Anure Bandar Kirimitiyawa. My name is Warana uh, Pulasti Kirimitiawa. We all have long names in Sri Lanka. <laughs> I moved here with my parents in 1989. We moved here um, because there was quite a lot of civil unrest in Sri Lanka. I was born in a, a high class family. My father was the last Bisawa in Sri Lanka. That is title given by the Queen. As I understand it, that is equivalent to a um, governor general kind of post. As part of that post, in 1953, when the Queen visited Sri Lanka, he got to welcome her to, to Sri Lanka. That is my father. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, when I was born, he had passed away already, so I never got to meet him. But, um, you know, he had done a lot of great things in Sri Lanka like building the schools, um, and a lot for the temples that were around our districts. My father had a, had a costume for the royal ceremonies like that. My, my father qualified to wear that one after getting this hour. This, this is the jacket. So the jacket is made of velvet and the lion is a symbol in, in Sri Lanka. It's very elaborate and the people those days took a lot of time in the detail um, in creating these costumes um, because they were worn in such important occasions. They wanted to show off our culture. It's weaved in gold thread. Um, they were rubies and gems encrusted in this particular jacket but um, a lot of them have been taken out over time or have fallen out yeah. as well. So the costume consists of a, a hat and a vest. Then there's a very large um, garment that makes up. It's kind of like a sarong, but um, wrapped uh, 12 times around. Yeah. And it has some shoes and there's a, a piece called a kinesia, which is like a knife um, that they used to carry as part of the costume. So this is the kinesia that, that was worn with the belt. The handle's made of ivory, and those are uh, rubies that are encrusted in it. When we bought it over, my dad had to apply for a special concession from the government to bring over ivory, because um, ivory is an illegal traded commodity these days. We had to bring it over as part of our family heirloom and declare that to the government. It takes uh, about an hour or two to put the costume on and um, also there's a special person that comes out um, that knows how everything fits together 
uh, in order to put it on a person. You can't self-dress, so as a result, I don't think any of us know how to put it on yes. <laughs> in its entirety. I wore the costume as part of my wedding uh, in Sri Lanka, but um, unfortunately the one that we have um, is, is quite old, so it's deteriorated quite a bit. As a result, I couldn't wear the original, but um, I did wear a replica as part of our tradition. I know my dad was quite proud to see me in it um, because he himself didn't wear it for his wedding. <laughs> so to have his son wear it was a big day for him. <laughs> <laughs> That's the actual costume? Yeah, this is the actual costume. I actually got my from my father, so now it's with me. And I wanted to pass it to him and it's going like that. It's a big responsibility. I'd like to pass it down to my children and, and have it go down the generations. When I go back to Sri Lanka now, a lot of people that are a lot older than me talk to me about, and I'm proud of my grandfather. Hopefully I can strive to be um, as half as good as him, but um, it's great for our family beginnings and just the way that things have um, been handed down to us. Um, yeah, so we're very lucky. <laughs> I start every day with a pot of peanut butter porridge. Now this is wonderful. I've got my whole family loving it now. Food is very, very important in most social aspects in Zimbabwe. Because you find that if you go to a village and they've got, let's say, five chickens, if you're a visitor, um, they'll have one for you. And it's that whole great uh, feeling of hospitality. Food becomes a great social connector and many of the Ethiopians in Mount Roscoe are keeping the community bonded uh, through the daily coffee ritual, or buna. I'm from Ethiopia. I came to New Zealand in 2001, and um, currently I'm a student at the Unitec former president of the Ethiopian community. I married July 2002, and now we have got one daughter. She's five and a half. We are happy. <laughs> In Auckland, there is about between two to 2,500 Ethiopian refugees, mainly dominated in Morocco. Ethiopia is one of the largest ethnic diversity in the world. As we have like about 18 different languages, 200 dialects. People from all that background, we have one or another way of a social integration, eating together, drinking together. So we are trying to keep those things. Today we will have a coffee ceremony at First Vita Gustas' house. She's going to prepare the Ethiopian coffee ceremony. And uh, she lived in uh, Mount Roskoll. The coffee ceremony is one of the integral part of the Ethiopian social and cultural life. Normally in villages and countryside, it's three, three times a day, but at least once a day, it's a must. If you are invited for the coffee ceremony, it's a mark of friendship and you are highly respected to be part of that. As you see that she's preparing an Ethiopian traditional way of making coffee as a kind of small pan with a long hand to avoid the heat. And she's roasting the coffee and then it will be grinded. Then it will be boiled with a special pot. It's open fire, so you roast it nicely. You can smell the aroma of the coffee while it's roasted. And once it's finished roasted, Fetfute will take it around to smell so that you can smell the aroma. That is part of the ceremony. This is a cold jebana in Amharic, and it's a pot just to boil the coffee. It's made of a pure clay, 
and handmade. And in the southern part of Ethiopia, mostly they use the coffee when it's ready. They get a little bit of butter, which is um, homemade, and they put a little bit for the taste and um, salt in rural areas where there is no sugar available. Sometimes it's very difficult in countryside, very remote areas. Just <coughs> to give a bit of... <laughs> Coffee disaster. <laughs> Sorry. While we're doing the coffee ceremony, this uh, usually happens because the smoke alarm is always there, and so it's normal. You have to drink three cups, and the first one is called Abol in Amharic, and the second one is Uletenya, and the third one is called uh, Baraka. The coffee is weaker and weaker when you get the first one and second is weaker and the third is more weaker. I think it's much to do with the time spending together. That's what I believe, because the more you have time to sit together, if it's one cup, you drink it, you leave. So it gives you a bit of time to chat and talk. Oh, this is this much, much nicer than cappuccino and flat white. <laughs> this is Arabica from Ethiopia. Yeah, so it's one of the highest market in the world and the world uh, commodity. But the farmers of Ethiopians are getting a peanut out of it. So for all Kiwis, when they think of a glass of a, a cup of coffee, we want them to remember those farmers and do a fair trade to support those uh, poor peasants of Ethiopia. It is very important to keep that coffee ceremony. as mainly for the for the social integration and because uh, many people who came to New Zealand, there are so many of them that don't speak English. But when they get together with the coffee ceremony, they chat with their own language. So it is good for them. It re removes that stigma, that loneliness. So it's kind of a symbolic for us to uh, identify us from any other culture. So that is unique for us and important, yeah. Since coming to New Zealand, I never felt I had to change to fit in. The things that are essential to my way of life, my family, food, music, dancing, they've all been embraced by my neighbors in Mount Roscoe, and that's what makes it home. What I love is that you can be whatever you want to be here. Do whatever you want to do. The only things holding you back are in your mind, and that's what we all want for our families, right? Supporting local content so you can see more of New Zealand on air.